Now we're recording. The reason we're doing this is for the sake of those people who can't be here today, they have a chance to, to see it. Okay? Um, this is the outline, or rather, these are the policies that we were talking about. You've got them all printed out. I want to make sure everybody's clear on that. Um, next slide. This is the, the outline for the class. First, today we're going to talk about the authority interpretation of the Old Testament for Christians. Particularly we're going to discuss why it is that we should be studying the Old Testament, why it's important, and why, unfortunately, uh, many Christians don't understand the importance, the, the critical importance, I believe, of the Old Testament to our own personal growth and faith. We then are going to look at a little bit of the background structure and form of the Old Testament, both the Protestant way that we usually look at the Old Testament and also the Jewish way, because they have a very different way of organizing it and thinking about it. We are, um, the, we're going to focus on those things today and a little bit about how we got the Old Testament, because it's, it's a, fairly, um, a fairly complicated story, you know, uh, full of intrigue and exciting characters and subterfuge and all sorts of things, but, but we'll talk about that as we go along. So we'll talk today about authority and interpretation of the Old Testament for Christians, background structure and form, and how we got the Old Testament. Next week, we are going to start on the actual content of the Old Testament with the Pentateuch, or Torah. Pentateuch means literally five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible, which are called the books of Moses, because tradition holds that Moses wrote them. More liberal scholars have problems with the fact that it includes a description of his death and, and, and what happened after his death. And they're going, okay, Moses wrote the, about his death and that what happened after his death. Uh, and the very conservatives say, well, it was a miraculous vision that God gave Moses. Well, that could have happened. There are other places where Moses refers to things like the land you know, of the Canaanites um, and entering the, the, the land given to the tribe of Benjamin before any of that had happened. It's possible God did that miraculously. I think it's more likely that some of these bits and pieces of things may have been added later as further explanation. But at its core, we believe that the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, were written by Moses. They are called uh, the sometimes called the books of Moses, or the five books of Moses, the, the Jews will call them. Pentateuch means five books. Torah is a Hebrew word which means law, because those first five books are also called the books of the law. Next week, we are going to talk about um, Genesis. The first 11 chapters of Genesis are called the historic prologue because the first 11 chapters have to do with from the creation of the world up through four great events we'll talk about next week until the introduction in the 12th chapter of Abraham, who was the father of the uh, Hebrew people. He's also the father of the Islamic people, and he is the father of the Christian people. There are three the three great monotheistic religions all look to Abraham as their father. So next week we're going to deal with the pro historic prologue, or the prehistoric prologue, and the patriarchs, which are Abraham, his son Isaac, Isaac's son Jacob, and one of Jacob's son Joseph. Those are the four patriarchs. That takes you to the end of Genesis. We're going to establish the whole foundation of the universe and the creation uh, and direction of the Hebrew people next week in Genesis. Then two weeks from now, we're going to look at the rest of the Torah, the law, the books of the law, which are um, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and especially having to do with the giving of the law through Moses, which happens in Exodus, the great redemption of bringing the Israelites out of captivity in, in uh, Egypt, and the giving of the law. Then we're going to get into the former prophets, as they are called. We'll describe why they're the former prophets. We'll talk about history in the prophets of the Old Testament. Joshua and Judges, which are the taking and establishing of the land. Samuel 1 and 2, uh, and Kings 1 and 2, which is about the monarchy. And I'm going to explain why 1 and 2 is in parentheses in just a minute. Uh, next slide. Then we'll talk about the next week, prophets and prophecy, what prophecy is. And look at the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, minor prophets, the book of the twelve, which I'll explain to you. That's what the Hebrews call it. They take all of what we call the minor prophets, the twelve minor prophets, and it's one book in the Hebrew Bible. And they call it the book of the twelve. So we'll look at the rest of the prophets, and then in the sixth week we'll look at the writings. 
which are the books of truth, Psalm, Proverbs, and Job, the five scrolls, or the five megalot, the Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Esther, and then other writings, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. The seventh week, we will look at the foundational books, particularly as uh, Benware presents them in his, in his book. And then, eighth week, we will look at Messianic prophecy and the, the bridge from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Okay. Now, I reserve the right, since this is the first time we've done this course, to modify this as I go along. But this is the direction we're looking at right now. So that you'll get both an introduction to, um, to what's behind the Old Testament and how we got it, but also an introduction to the content and what God is doing in that. Now, Wednesday of this week, we start a class, some of you are already registered for, called Old Testament Theology. The difference between those two, Old Testament Survey, this class, is looking at what is in the Old Testament? What does it say? What has God given us in terms of information and content and direction in the Old Testament? What does it tell us about God and about us and about how we and God are supposed to fit together, especially through the history of the Hebrew people? Next, uh, next class, on Wednesday, Old Testament Theology, we're going to be looking at what does it mean? How, do we, or how are we to understand that in terms of big themes, especially theologies, a theology of creation, a theology of God? Creator, a theology of sin, of redemption, of the law. So that's what we're going to deal with on Wednesday. This class is getting into the nitty gritty of what is in the Old Testament. Okay, what's it all about? Wednesday is how are we supposed to understand the themes and, how, and, and to, to take understanding out of it. All right? Any questions about that in terms of content? You have this outline, so you know where we're going with it. If I change it, I'll let you know. All right, next slide. Now, I want to start with, first, um, on what do we base our faith as Christians? This class, the, the seminary, you all have been in my Bible class. Many of you, not all of you, but many of you. I focus more when I do a Bible study, like our Friday Bible studies, on transformation more than information. Sometimes information can be transformational, knowing that it all makes sense and it all fits together. But the, the purpose of studying the Bible like we do it on, on Fridays is transformation. This is, I hope, will be a transformational class for you, but it, it's also information. This is, this is going to be a little more academic. There's content here for you to study. I encourage you to take notes. I'm going to be providing you written material and stuff, but I encourage you to plan on writing some stuff down because it will help you remember it. But all of this, even though it's going to be some information, is oriented toward our Christian faith. Our belief in God, our relationship with God is given through Jesus Christ. And we base our faith on four things that are God's revelation to us. First, we believe that God has revealed himself in Scripture. This is the ultimate authority. This is the place in which God, our God has not been silent. Our God has not, has not, people say, oh, you know, God's so mysterious and everything else. Mostly if people say that, they haven't bothered to read this book. Because God has, has been very proactive in telling us about himself and his will for us and his desire and the purpose of humanity and all of that in this book. So our first source for our faith, our first authority for our faith, is God's revelation in Scripture. And that's why we're studying the Old Testament. We're going to talk about why specifically the Old Testament a little bit. The second way in which God has revealed himself and the foundation for our faith is that God has revealed himself through the church, the body of his son Jesus, alive on earth, down through history. Particularly, that's as reflected in the great creeds of the church. In our church, we use the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, but as a Presbyterian church, there are actually 13 creeds down through the last 2,000 years that are expressions the church has made of what our faith is. And people say, well, why do you need a creed? It's all in the Bible. Well, try reading the whole Bible on a Sunday morning for, you know, when you gather for worship. The idea of a creed is it is a, an abbreviated, a shorthand statement of what we believe. But those creeds do not have the same authority as Scripture does. Yes, John? How many creeds did you say? Thirteen. In the book of creeds of the Presbyterian Church. By the way, thank you for raising your hand. If you guys have a question, please raise your hand. Stop me. I'm not, uh, I, I get on a roll, but I do remember that you're in the room too. And I'll be happy to, to answer any questions that come up, okay, as we go along. So, first, the revelation of God in Scripture. Second, the revelation God has given to His church. You'll notice that's a capital C. That is to the whole church down through history. Third, the revelation of God in the world. God made all the world, and it reflects His creation. 
All right, Scripture says that if we are just paying attention, the stars of the heavens will reflect the glory of God. Another way that it happens that God reveals himself in the world is through rationality. You know, God made us rational creatures. He wants us to use them. Now he wants us to use it in the right way, not in the way that denies him because of our own pride. But if we use it well, our minds as well as our experience of the world around us can be a testimony of, of God's revelation to us. And the fourth way is the revelation of God to individual people or small groups. God does speak through people. God speaks through our session about what he wants our church to do. You know, God speaks through individuals who have a vision for serving God through a particular kind of ministry. Now, if God comes to a, a person and says, you're the first one I have ever told the truth of it to. You know, you're the first one who's ever going to figure this out, and I'm going to give you golden tablets and secret eyeglasses, and you're the only one who's going to ever see them. And so you're going to have the new revelation that no one has received before in the 2,000 years. Then no. If it's not in Scripture, if it has not been reflected by God's revelation to the church down through history, you know, if it in some way is inconsistent with what God allows us to understand and perceive in His creation in the world, then there's a problem with it. If our church decided that Jesus was a great guy, but he wasn't really the Son of God, well, there's a problem. Because the first authority we have is the Word of God, which says that he was. And so we don't do that. But still, God does speak. He reveals himself through individuals and through, through smaller groups of people. But the, these things are hierarchical. The authority of Scripture comes first. Second underneath that is what God has said down through history through the church. Third is... I believe what God reveals to himself through rationality and through the, the beauty of creation and the rest of his natural or, or general revelation, and then revelation of God to specific people. That's what we take truth from. Since the first priority we have is belief in the authority given uh, through the revelation of Scripture, next slide. By the way, the reason that John is helping me, and I'm very grateful for that, is I got here and my remote control battery was dead and it takes a special battery I couldn't replace. So, First, we believe that the Word of God, the Bible, is revealed. From Jeremiah 30, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, Write in a book all the words I have spoken to you. We believe, Old Testament and New Testament, the Scripture was revealed by God. Second, we believe that it is inspired by God. That it's not something that these guys just said, Hey, you know, this would be good, I'll write this down. But rather that God, through the Holy Spirit, inspired it in people. 2 Timothy says, all scripture is God-breathed. We talk about the Holy Spirit inspiring this. The, the, um, the word for spirit is pneuma, which is also the word for breath. It's where we get pneumonia, breath, okay? But pneuma is the Holy Spirit. So when it says all scripture is God-breathed, there is implied in that the presence of the Spirit. All scripture is God-breathed and it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God inspires the writing of Scripture, or inspired the writing of Scripture, through His Holy Spirit down through time. Third, we believe it is authoritative. 1 Corinthians 15, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. See, looking to the Scriptures for the authority to, to prove this. And that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. Now, interestingly enough, and I'll talk about this in a minute, in all but one place in 2 Peter, when it talks about the scriptures, like here in 1 Corinthians 15, it's talking about the Old Testament more than the New Testament. Okay? 2 Peter specifically says, it's talking about the writings of Paul <coughs> as being scripture. But everywhere else it talks about the scripture in the New Testament, when Jesus talks about Scripture, or the apostles, or the, or the writers of the New Testament, like Luke was an apostle, but he wrote uh, Luke and Acts, they're talking about the Old Testament, which is one of the reasons we study it. Now, we know the New Testament later was ordained by God as Scripture, and he affirmed that through his church. Okay. And finally, we believe that Scripture is living. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. That's Hebrews 4.12. It is a living thing. How many of you have ever read the same passage in Scripture two times or three times or four times, and all of a sudden, this time, there's something that comes out of it that you never saw before? As though it has somehow changed. Exactly. That it is a living thing that God the Holy Spirit causes to 
touch our lives in new ways as though as we have greater needs or different needs. Right? We believe the Word of God is revealed, it is inspired, it is authoritative, it is living. And that's the main reason we study Scripture. Okay? So, but why in the Old Testament? I recently um, preached at a church, and I preached from the Old Testament. And I was told that for 11 years, the person who had been at that church had never preached a sermon on the Old Testament. <laughs> Because, apparently, many Christians believe that the Old Testament is old, that it's no longer valid, that it's no longer for us, that it has been superseded by the New Testament. <clears throat> well, that's not really an evangelical belief. That's not a, an Orthodox Christian belief. Our belief is that the Old Testament, or covenant, the word that we use, Testament, Old Testament, New Testament, probably a better translation will be covenant or, or agreement. There was the old agreement that God had with the Hebrew people, because the Old Testament is the story of the Jewish people, of the Hebrew people, but that that is foundational to the new covenant, or new testament, the new agreement that God made available to us in Jesus Christ. So let's talk for a few minutes about why we believe in studying the Old Testament. John? First, the Old Testament, as I just said, is the scriptures... Scriptures that's being referred to in the New Testament by Jesus and the apostles and the New Testament writers, when they say Scripture, they mean the Old Testament. And sometimes we read passages like the Timothy passage, all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, and we automatically think he's talking about Paul, or he's talking about, about you know, the Gospels, or whatever. He's not. The only passage we have, 2 Peter 3.16, refers to Scripture as some of the writing Paul had done. But every other case, our indication is that Scriptures means the Old Testament. Um, Jesus refers to the Old Testament over and over again. But again, when we talk about linking the Old Testament to the New Testament, Jesus talks about he himself being the fulfillment of what the Old Testament presents. Matthew 5, 17 and 18 says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. And by the way, law and the prophets, or sometimes law, prophets, and writing, that's, that's shorthand, meaning the Old Testament. All right. The law and the prophets was a way of talking about the Jewish scripture, or the Hebrew Bible. Jesus said, Do not think I have come to abolish the law and the prophets, the Hebrew Bible. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. The New Covenant, the New Testament did not do away with all of the content that God shared with his people in the Old Testament. He <clears throat> fulfilled it, as Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. The new covenant, the act of Jesus in saving us, fulfills what is in the Old Testament. But you can't really fully appreciate that fulfillment, I don't think, unless you understand what the Old Testament promised that was to be fulfilled. Okay, On the Emmaus Road, when Jesus comes along and mysteriously is talking. It's after his resurrection. He's talking to these two guys walking along about all that's been happening in Jerusalem. And at the end, at the very end, he reveals himself as being Jesus. But along the way, after they're talking, he, it, this is uh, Luke 24, 25 to 27. It reads, He said to them, How foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. That's the Old Testament. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Jesus, in describing his role as the Messiah, <clears throat> presented the story from the law and the prophets, from Moses and the prophets of the Old Testament. Who are we to throw all that away? If Jesus felt like that was the best way to understand him as the Messiah. And in Luke 24, a little further on, verse 44, it says, He said to them, this is the disciples now in Jerusalem, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Again, Psalms is kind of shorthand for the wisdom writings, the writings. We'll talk about what that means in a minute. Jesus said, everything must be fulfilled that is written about me, Jesus, in the, law of the Mos in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He doesn't mean the New Testament scriptures. He means the Old Testament scriptures. And we just throw this stuff away sometimes. Don't even think about it. And finally, John 5, 
Jesus said, you study the scriptures, the Old Testament, diligently because you think that in them you possess eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to, have, to come to me to have life. So the idea is that Jesus presents himself as the fulfillment of the Old Testament. When Jesus is talking about his own um, role as Messiah, his saving act, he describes it in terms of what was promised in the Old Testament. If you go to the book of, of Acts and you look at the first great sermon of Peter at Pentecost in Acts 2, he starts in the Old Testament. Almost all of it is a description of how Jesus is the fulfillment of what the Old Testament talked about. Stephen, before he is martyred, he talks about the Old Testament stories and how this was a prediction of the coming of the Messiah who was Jesus and why and how Jesus fulfilled that. And over and over, as we look at the passages in, especially Acts, but in the rest of the New Testament. So, we believe that the scriptures um, referred to by Jesus and the apostles are, something on my uh, spider web, um, are fully necessary because that's what Jesus is talking about. How Jesus presents himself as being a fulfillment of that Old Testament. There's also an assumption by some of the, the New Testament writers that people will understand the Old Testament. They will be familiar with it. The book of Revelation. People read the book of Revelation and they go, what? What? Lions and, you know, flying monkeys and all kinds of this stuff. What is that all about? Well, you know what? If you have a familiarity with the Old Testament, like the visions of Daniel, for instance, then all of that begins to make sense. The book of Revelation has 350 different either quotes or references to the Old Testament. Binware mentions that in the introduction of his book. 350, just in the book of Revelation. The assumption, I think, that John had in writing the book of Revelation is that we would get a lot of understanding based upon what we knew from the Old Testament, and yet we don't even study the Old Testament the way we should. Okay? The second reason I think we need to study the Old Testament is that the Old Testament is part of God's inspired revelation to us. When we talk about Scripture being the first line of authority for God's revelation to us. That includes the Old Testament. Two-thirds of it, almost, is the Old Testament. And so it, it absolutely has to be worthy of us to study. God didn't say anywhere, oh, well, you don't have to read that part anymore because I've changed my mind. Okay? God doesn't change. There is still validity in that. Now, yes, we rely on the promise of salvation in the saving act of Jesus Christ, but even that is much richer in our understanding of it because of the Old Testament. And that is part of God's revelation to us. The third reason I believe is that the Old Testament is foundational to our understanding. This is sort of fundamental, this is basic to everything I've been saying so far. If you really want to understand the much of what Jesus said, much of what the apostles say, much of what Paul's writing is about, you need to understand the Old Testament. The, the doctrine of creation, that God created everything that is, where is that presented? In Genesis. Okay. In fact, if you, if you wanted to, to do a, a, a shorthand version of what our understanding of God needs to be in order to be fulfilling, it is to understand creation, that God made everything that is, including us, and therefore has a claim on us, and redemption, that God then saves us. If we have an accurate understanding of God being the Creator God and the Redeemer God in Jesus Christ, then we can have an accurate representation or understanding of who God is in terms of His place in our lives. Creation and redemption. Well, you know what? The creation story is in Genesis, and the first act of redemption that God points to over and over and over again is in the book of Exodus. In fact, Jesus, in coming to redeem us from our sin and dying on the cross for us, is really, a, again, a fulfillment of the redemption promise of Jesus, which began with the Exodus. From, the, from Exodus throughout the whole rest of the Old Testament, for the next 1,400, well, 1,200 years, they describe God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who brought us up out of slavery in Egypt. The Redeemer. God is our Redemptor. Jesus perfected that and fulfilled it in redeeming us from our sins. But redemption starts in the book of Exodus in God's plan. Okay? You could even say that it started with Noah. That God redeemed Noah and his family being righteous from the destruction that came upon the rest of the world. 
So we need to understand the Old Testament to be able to understand most of the basic doctrines that are reflected in the New Testament. The doctrines like creation, sin, the fall, the doctrine of covenant, of redemption, of salvation, all of those have their roots, their foundation, the basic understanding of what they mean in the Old Testament. And then they are fulfilled in the New. So we need to understand how they're presented in the Old Testament. Romans 15, 4 says, For everything that was written in the past, that's the Old Testament, was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the Scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. The Old Testament was written to teach us, to give us endurance, encouragement, and hope. We need to pay attention to that. Therefore, we can't understand, I don't think, the New Testament fully. We can't fully appreciate even what Jesus has done for us. Yes, we can be saved. I'm not saying that. But we can't really understand what that means and apply it to our lives fully unless we understand what the Old Testament teaches us. Um, the fourth point is that the Old Testament is practical. Those of you who are part of our church know that I did a long series called Real People, where I started at the start of the Old Testament. I worked my way through... And I would take an Old Testament character like Joshua and tell the story briefly and then say, why is this story here? I mean, why has it come down to us over a thousand, you know, three thousand years now? Um, why is that important? Somebody went through a lot of effort to bring that story down to us. Well, because there are practical lessons for us to learn and how to live our lives in a godly way from those stories. Genesis teaches us where we came from, what's wrong with us. And what God desires for us. You know, without the book of Genesis, it would be to me unfathomable to try to understand what, what in the world is wrong with people. Why is there so much spite and meanness and, and anger and bitterness and war? None of that makes any sense. I mean, you would despair, to my mind, you would despair of humanity unless you knew what the source of all of that was and what God plans to do about it. Well, that goes back to Genesis, to the fall. Job is the greatest essay ever written to help us deal with suffering. Even people who aren't religious people look to the book of Job for an understanding of how to deal with grief and suffering and pain. The book of Psalms teach us how to praise and worship God. Proverbs and Ecclesiastes teach us what wisdom is and why and how we should gain it. Um, and on and on. Those are all ways in which the Old Testament is practical for our lives. But we have to pay attention to, us, to it. And the final reason I have here, and I didn't capitalize my T in the Testament, the Old Testament points us to Jesus Christ. Now, there's a balance here. Um, the, the, another book that I liked part of, <coughs> an Old Testament survey book, was a book by Norman Geisler, who's a conservative theologian, um, a survey of the Old Testament. And in fact, he was a teacher of uh, Benware's, and Benware quotes him several places. I like Eisler's book, except there's one thing he does which I think is overdone, and that is everything about the Old Testament, Geisler presents it in terms of how it points to Jesus. And I think it does point to Jesus. We also need to understand that when the Old Testament was written, it was before Jesus came, it was written to the Hebrew people first, and there is value and content in that too. You know, but the, the Jews did not need to know about Jesus a thousand years ago, in order to benefit from, from what God had shared in, through Moses in the Torah, in the first five books of the Bible. We then have the advantage of being able to look at that after the coming of Jesus and be able to understand that, the, that what Jesus did is a fulfillment of all that, so it makes it deeper and richer for us. But we also need to understand, and, and I think sometimes look at the Old Testament in terms of what God was saying to the Hebrew people and to people in general in addition to the blessing that we see in it through Jesus Christ. So we need to have a balance in that. Uh, but ultimately, the Old Testament does point to Jesus Christ. In uh, a book, E.F. Ellis is a theologian, has written a book called Paul's Use of the Old Testament. And he says this, here's a quote, For Paul, Christ was not only a factor giving added meaning to the Old Testament, but the only means whereby the Old Testament could be rightly understood. It was not merely that he saw Christ in the Old Testament, but that he viewed the whole scope of the Old Testament prophecy and history from the standpoint of the Messianic age in which the Old Testament stood open 
fulfilled in Jesus Christ and in his new creation. We have a dimension of understanding and appreciation, which Paul did, all of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, for the Old Testament that, that cannot be had otherwise. Um, I, many of you know that one of, I do consulting work in the States. When my largest client now, a uh, client I spend more time with, is Jews for Jesus. These are Messianic Jews. They are people who are either by heritage, meaning by, you know, they were born into Jewish families, or by conversion into Jewish faith. They are Jewish, but all of them have come to believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior, Jesus as the Messiah, who came for the Jew first and also for the Gentile, as, as Paul says. And so everybody in who's a missionary with Jews for Jesus is either a Jewish believer in Jesus or is married to a Jewish person who believes in Jesus, okay? Meaning, meaning they can be Gentile married to a Jew, Jewish Christian, and, and they still work there. But um, their whole focus is to share Jesus as the Messiah, Jesus Messiah, uh, Yeshua HaMashiach, to Jewish people around the world. To look at the Old Testament and say, look, this is what God promised. Look at Jesus. He is the fulfillment, perfectly, of the promise God made. How much richer it is to be able to look at Jesus and understand all that God did to prepare for that through the Old Testament. The writings of the Old Testament and the events that led to the writing of the Old Testament. Okay. One last quote I would read in terms of why we should study the Old Testament. This is from the book, some of you were here a few minutes early and I mentioned that that um, I like the Ben Ware book. My favorite Old Testament survey book is by David Allen Hubbard, William Sanford Lasor, and Fred Bush, who were two of them. One was the president of the seminary I went to, Fuller. The other one was my Old Testament professor, and one had just retired as Old Testament professor. Um, but it cost $35. So I didn't, didn't put that on you all. We get a less expensive book. But uh, it's what, if, you're, if you get into this and are interested, it's, I think, the best Old Testament survey out there. This is a quote that Lasor, Bush, and Hubbard have in their Bible in conclusion. In study, as in worship, humankind needs the entire revelation, that is, the whole Bible. The Old Testament belongs not to the Jewish people alone, but to us all. It is the account of the ways in which God has worked. It is the summary of what he has demanded. It is the record of his preparation for Christ's coming. It is the best canvas on which to catch the picture of his dealings with the human family throughout the centuries. I like that. Dealing with the human family, not just the Jews. In short, it is the indispensable foundation on which the New Testament is built. Okay. That says it well for me. We need to have all of God's revelation, Old and New Testament as well. And that's why we're going to spend time studying the Old Testament. One last thing I want to mention, and then we're going to take a break, break for a few minutes. It's kind of warm in here. We may open some windows. Um, as we talk about Scripture, Old Testament now, New Testament next term. Next term we're going to do New Testament survey and New Testament theology. Um, we're talking about the canon of Scripture. That's, that's C-A-N-O-N, not C-A-N-N. C-A-N-N-O-N would be... We're talking about the canon, C-A-N-O-N. That comes from a Greek word, kanon. A kanon was a, literally a yardstick. It was a rod that was unbendable, that was measured, that the Greek architects would use for designing and building houses, or buildings. Okay? So it was a yardstick, the canon. That word, canon, or canon, became a symbol for something that is true and reliable. The thing you can measure stuff with and know that it's going to be right. That word canon, because it came to be a symbol for something that is accurate and unchanging, is a word that be began by early Christians to be applied to Scripture. This is the canon of Scripture. It is the yardstick that we measure our lives by. And it's a wonderful word. I think it's one that we, we want to, to think in terms of this being the unbendable, accurate thing that, by which we can measure our lives as God has revealed it to us. So this is the canon of Scripture, and you'll hear me talk about that. As we go through here, from time to time, I will use a word that you may not know, or you may find a word uh, in the book as you read it, like a word like redactor. You know what a redactor is? It's an editor. Okay? Somebody who takes a document and adds to it or takes away from it or puts it to it, that's a redactor. You'll find words like hermeneutics and other things. We'll talk about those as we go along. 
one of your assignments is, for those of you reading the book, or even those of you studying on your own, when you come back to class each week, if there are words you come across or concepts that you don't understand, then you need to ask me, and I'll help with that. Okay? That's why I'm here. All right, let's take a break. Um, it is, I've got three minutes till. We will get back together at five minutes after, and I'm going to be strict about that. Um, we will start classes, on, by the way, on time. When we take breaks, I'll tell you when we're going to start, and we'll start back. I'm not going to be upset if you walk in five minutes late, but don't expect to wait. Don't expect us to wait for you, okay? So we, we get a lot of stuff to cover. So, five minutes after, and I have right now have two minutes till. So, seven. You're on. And th this first time we're doing this, um, I may have to redo this lecture anyway because we're, we're just figuring all of this out, okay? Um, traditionally, the books of the Old Testament, um, from a Protestant perspective, there are 39 books in the Old Testament. If you pick up your Bible, if you're a Protestant, you pick up your Bible and you look at the Old Testament, there will be 39 books. You know, starting with Genesis, you know, the first five books going all the way through Malachi. Uh, traditionally, the 39 books, Protestants, I, I say Protestants because if you're a Catholic, your Bible will have 46 books in the Old Testament. If you're Orthodox, it will have slightly more than that. Because the Catholics have, uh, except what's called the Apocrypha, books like 1st and 2nd Maccabees, and 1st, 2nd, 3rd uh, uh, Edras, and uh, Bell and the Dragon, and various other things. I'm going to get into that stuff later. Just understand that, and, and, and why, in fact, I may get into that a little bit today. The apocryphal books were, were intertestamental. They were written after Malachi, the last Old Testament book that we recognize, before Matthew, during what's called the Hasmonean period, when the Maccabees were, you know, really caught, led the Jews in an uprising against their, their rulers and reestablished the faith and the worship in the Jerusalem temple and all that. I'll explain later why those things aren't in our Bible, why they are in the Catholic Bible, if you have, for instance, a Jerusalem Bible, have you guys seen the Jerusalem Bible? I've got one in my office. It has the Apocrypha in it. So the Catholic Bible has more books. Um, they have seven more books in the Old Testament. The Orthodox have a couple more than that. The Orthodox meaning like Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, the Eastern Orthodox churches. Our, uh, yes, Grace. There's an easy way of remembering that there are 39 books. Okay. They're uh, counting the letters three in the word old, and nine in the word testament. There you go. And when you go to the New Testament, you multiply them. Three times nine, and that's 27. Oh, very good. So there's 66 books. Very good. You guys hear that? <laughs> there's 39 books, and if you count the letters in Old Testament, it's three and nine, 39 books. Um, and just, you multiply the three together, three times nine is 27, there's 27 books in the New Testament. Just little mnemonic thing, although I'm going to now get into shortly why there aren't really 39 books in the Old Testament, but that's just, <laughs> you know. The traditional Protestant way of looking at the Old Testament, with our 39 books, we typically break the Old Testament up into four books. You know, I think this must, uh, it sounds like something Americans would have done, uh, you know, breaking things up the way they want to do it, rather than the way it was done before. The four sections that we typically think of as being in the Old Testament are first the law, which is also called the Torah in Hebrew, which means it's Torah is the word for law. It's also the Pentateuch, which means five books. Sometimes it's called the five books of Moses or the law of Moses, some combination of those things. The second section that most Protestants think about are the books of history. There are 12 of those from Joshua through Esther. So you get the first five, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Then the next 12, starting with Joshua, going through Esther, and this is the order that they're in in our Bible, the next 12 are books of history. Then we have five books that are called the wisdom books, from Job to Song of Songs. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs. And then the fourth section in the Protestant view is, are the books of prophecy, starting with Isaiah and going through Malachi. There are 17 books in our Bible. Sometimes we break those up into the major prophets, which are um, Isaiah through Daniel, and the minor prophets, 
So there are five major prophets, 12 minor prophets, Hosea through Malachi being the minor prophets. Major and minor, not because of being more important or less important, but because of being longer. The major prophets are long books. The minor prophets are small books. That's just like the, the, in the New Testament, after you get through the Gospels and Acts, and we start with Romans, everything from Romans to right before Revelation, well, at least the letters of Paul, are put in order of length. The, sh the long books are first, the short books are at the end. That's not the order they were written in. Um, P.D. Gerlach loaned me a book recently um, called The Revolutionary Bible. Is that what it is? Or The Revolution? The Bible Study. Yeah. Where he's taken and, and reordered the books according to the chronological <laughs> order. Which and, and he's not the first one to do that, actually. There are others that have done it. But the order that we have things in, in our Protestant Bibles, is kind of strange reasons. You know, you put them in order of the longest books first. You know, what's that all about? Um, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Yeah, maybe so you can stack them up and it's, <laughs> it, it looks neat. You know, uh, maybe that was it. So this is the way Protestants typically look at it, the Old Testament. This is not the way the Hebrew people saw their Bible, either in, in Old Testament times, I mean in ancient times, or in modern times. The Hebrew people see their Bible, go ahead, as having 24 books. Now, note, the 24 books that the, the Jewish people see as it being in the Hebrew Bible are exactly the same content, same number of letters, well, same number of words, as we have in our 39 books of the, of the Protestant Bible. They break it up differently, okay? For instance, that, well, I'll do it this way. They have three big categories. The first category is the same. It's the law, the Torah, the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. To the Jewish people and to anybody else looking at the Old Testament, the first five books of the Old Testament, the books of the law, the books of Moses, Pentateuch, Torah, they are the most authoritative by far. They're the ones on, you know, that, they're the ones that tell how the world was created, how sin came into the world, the, how the Hebrew people started, uh, how God created His covenant, how God redeemed His people through bringing them out of slavery in Egypt. Uh, it's the, the outlining, you know, the giving of the law and what is God's will. All of that's in the Pentateuch. So it's, it is the high point, and therefore nobody messes with that one. That's the five books of the law. Everybody sees that as the same. But the Jews saw the second category. This went kind of funky on the, uh, but I carried it over. Uh, the second category are the prophets, they call them. And the prophets, which is, is Nevaim, Nevaim, and there's a reason I'm giving you the Hebrew words here. Torah are the first five books, the law. Nevaim is the, are the book of the prophets. They count eight of those. The reason they count eight of those is because the, um, we have 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Samuel, um, we have the 12 minor prophets, right? You know why we have 1st Kings and 2nd Kings? Because in the old days when this stuff was, was written on, uh, on, well, parchment later, but earlier when it was written on papyrus, and they would write it on a sheet of papyrus, and they would glue it to the next sheet, and glue it to the next sheet, and they would make rolls. If you got very long, it was really hard to manage, and so they decided that kings was too much to put on one roll of, part of uh, papyrus, so they broke it in two and made first kings and second kings because it was hard to roll that much stuff up. Okay, those are longer books. The Hebrew Bible does not break it up. Kings is one book. Uh, Samuel is one book, not two. Okay. Uh, likewise, Ezra and Nehemiah, the story of the rebuilding of the, of the temple and of the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem, is one book, Ezra and Nehemiah. It's not two books. And then they take all of the minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, that's one book in the Hebrew Bible. The book of the twelve, it's called. So, they combine... Kings and Chronicles and uh, Samuel, they have one book for the 12 minor prophets. So they say that the prophets, the Nevi'im in Hebrew, is, is eight books. And then they have books that they call the writings. 
the Jews, uh, the writings or the Ketuvim, they're called. There are the books of truth, which are Psalms, Proverbs, and Job. Um, the Megalot, the five scrolls, Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Esther, and then other writings they're called, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. Now, and I'm going to show you the detail of that in a second, but the reason I want to lay it out this way for you, those three Hebrew words for law, prophets, and writings, Torah, Nevaim, and Ketuvim, they abbreviate them, push them all together to form one word, Tanakh, Torah, Nevaim, Ketuvim. Tanakh is the word that is used for the Hebrew Bible. If you talk to a Jewish person, if they're talking about the Hebrew Bible, they will call it the Tanakh. Because of the three big categories, and then the Hebrew words for those categories. Torah, Nevaim, Ketuvim. Tanakh. It's also sometimes called the Mikra, which means that which is read, because of the, the Jewish custom of reading scripture in public. Okay, the reading of the, of the Torah scrolls or the prophets in uh, Jewish worship. So sometimes you'll hear a Jewish person refer, refer to the Mikra, that which is read, which, me, it's, which is a synonym for Tanakh or the Hebrew Bible. Okay? Questions? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Are they actually arranged like this? No, they're actually in a different order. Well, roughly like what, what yeah. in fact, change, uh, let's go to the next order. slide. I'll show you. This is the way that it's laid out. Roughly, this is the order in the, 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 what I've done here in the Hebrew Bible. For instance, Chronicles is the last book in the Hebrew Bible. When I say the Hebrew Bible, I mean the Bible as the Jewish people have it today, the Tanakh. Um, and the so you've got the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Law, the Prophets, Nevi'im, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, one and two. Kings 1 and 2, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then the 12, which are the minor prophets that I read a minute ago, and I'm not going to read them again right now. And then you have the 11 books called the writings, the books of truth, Psalms, Proverbs, and Job, the five scrolls, or the five megillot. These are scrolls, each of which is read at a different festival or special celebration in the Jewish year. For instance, when you get to the season of Purim, which is the story of the book of Esther, Esther is the first great uh, threat against the Jewish people by political forces. If, you've read, if you know the book of Esther, it's when uh, the Haman, the terrible guy who doesn't like this Jewish uh, advisor to the, the king, convinces the king, uh, the king of the Medes and Persians, to destroy all the Jews, to kill them all. It just so happens, without realizing it, that, one of the, that the king's favorite wife, the princess, whose Hebrew name was Esther, is Jewish. He didn't know that. Well, Esther ends up, through circumstances, saving the Jewish people. Okay, her her uncle had a lot to do. Her cousin actually had a lot to do with that too. But anyway, every Purim, every celebration that, that of Purim, and once a year, the, the Jewish people will read that scroll, the whole book of Esther, out loud in worship. Okay, and it is one of the five Megillot. The singular for Megillot is scrolls. The singular Hebrew for scroll is Megillah. You ever heard the expression, oh yeah, man, he did the whole Megillah? No. You've never heard that? Okay, the whole Megillah? You ever heard that expression? Yeah, None of you ever? I have. You have, okay, some of you have. Well, that comes from the fact that it takes a long time to read the book of Esther. You know, they read the whole Megillah, the whole scroll, literally. Okay, because those scrolls, the, the, uh, the five scrolls, um, the five Megillah are the Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Esther, and each of them is read at a different special celebration every year for the Jews. That's why they're sort of gathered together. And then you have other writings, literally. They don't really believe they fit anywhere. We think of Daniel as being a prophetic book. Ezra and Nehemiah are historic books. But to them, Daniel is sort of a special category because a lot of Daniel, for one thing, is written, it's one of the few books in the Old Testament that's not written entirely in Hebrew. Part of it is in Aramaic. Aramaic was a common language in the Middle East, and uh, it, it was the language that the Assyrians, you know about the Assyrians, the ones that conquered the northern kingdom of, of Israel. Well, the Assyrians spoke primarily Aramaic, and then you get into other languages like Nabataean, which is a version of Aramaic. Jesus and the, the apostles probably spoke Aramaic as much as they did anything else. 
Back then, almost everybody spoke three languages. They would have spoken Greek, which was the scholarly language that you used in business. They would have spoken Aramaic as a common language, but they spoke Hebrew as the as the language of the uh, the ancient language of the Jewish people. Yes. Is there a book in the Bible called the Song of Songs? Yes, mm -hmm. we sometimes call it the Song of Solomon, oh. but the proper name is actually Song of Songs. Okay. okay? Yes, John. Uh, in, in some places that I've read, uh, I've noticed authors like Walter Brueggemann. He divides Isaiah into two, first Isaiah, second Isaiah. Is that just an editorial thing on his behalf, or is that a legitimate division? Well, there are suggestions. We're going to get to uh, where, where the Old Testament comes from for us. Uh, there is some suggestion that Isaiah may have been written by more than one person, and that there, there, there are textual differences, there are stylistic differences, and that Isaiah might be best understood as being you know, sort of of two parts. And so some people think of Isaiah 1 and 2. But, but mind, the, Jews, the Jews didn't divide no, it like that. They didn't. Okay. Uh, that's a very modern um, documentary kind of thing. Okay. Yes? So is there Bible that doesn't have the Bible, whatever they call it? Um, <laughs> Tanakh. Sorry, using that word. Um, in chronological order? It is not in chronological order. For instance, Chronicles... The book of Chronicles, Chronicles, what we know as 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles, covers exactly the same material as 1 and 2 Kings. Okay? The difference is that 1 and 2 Chronicles is, is more formal. And it's written more like the chronicler that was the official writer for the government. If somebody had the job, which they used to have this, of being the one who kept the chronicles of the events of the kings, and that's what, that's what Kings and Chronicles are about, kings, is what is the different kings who came to power and what major, you know, and you get a lot of that, you know, um, Haziah, you know, became king of Judah in the fourth year of King Ahaz of Israel. And then, you know, King blah blah of Israel became the king in the twelfth year of King blah blah of Judah. You know, when you have the two kingdoms, Israel and northern Judah and the south. So you get a lot of this kind of formal repetition of stuff. So first and second chronicles, one of the reasons I think it's at the end is that it's, it's, a Xerox with a little more formality of first and second kings. You know, first and second kings has got a little more spirit to it, a little more heart, a little, you know, a little more freedom. And so the first and second chronicles, it's almost like they put it at the end because they thought, ah, well, you know, take it or leave it. Uh, sort of like the reason that Luther put the book of James at the back of his Bible, uh, which is something I've never forgiven Luther. But because uh, he would call it a right straw epistle, didn't think that much of it, so we put it at the end where he wouldn't have to flip through it when he got looking for something else. So I think that's the reason for the primarily for the order. Okay, yeah, all the Presbyterian reasons. In the, in the. Um, okay, other questions about this. The the reason I'm introducing this to you is not only so that we can have an appreciation for how the Jews saw and how the Old Testament was seen by everybody up until uh, Christian days. But so that, uh, because we're going to look at it in this order. I think it's useful for us to think about Scripture in terms of the, the law, the prophets, and the writings. I quoted to you earlier where Jesus said, you know, uh, the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Okay? And in one place, another place, he says the law, the prophets, and psalm. Psalm is sort of an abbreviation because it was the most popular and the, and the longest. It's an abbreviation for writings because it's one of the books of the writings. Jesus himself referred to the Old Testament writings as the Law and the Prophets, or the Law of the Prophets and the Writings, the Psalms. Um, I think that's enough reason for me to want to look at it that way ourselves. Okay? If you look at the outline that I gave you, you will notice that that's, we're sort of going to be de dealing with it that way. I've broken it up into prophets, you know, into two sections of the Pentateuch, or Law, Torah, and then we will look at the former prophets and the latter prophets, See, that's the other thing, is that um, the, um, whereas Protestants talk about major prophets and minor prophets, which sort of sounds like a value judgment. It wasn't meant that way originally. It meant the longer ones and the shorter ones. The uh, Hebrews just talk about the um, former prophets and the latter prophets. The former prophets being the ones that have to do mostly with history, like Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, all right? And then the latter prophets are the ones that are more prophetic in terms of declaring God's will for, um, you know, for his people, more so than history. They're all prophetic, 
but some of them are, are prophecy based in history, and you'll notice in your outline, we're going to talk about prophecy and history at one point, and in another place we're going to talk about prophets and prophecy in the second class on the prophets, because that's, that's how the Hebrews broke them up. The former prophets being mostly historical, the latter prophets being mostly <coughs> prophetic in terms of God's declaration to the people, more than a recording of historical events that God had caused to happen. Is there a question or comment? Okay. So this is the structure we're going to use. This is the one that the Hebrew people have always understood. And still today, Hebrew Bibles are set up this way. So we will be looking at the Tanakh, the Torah, Nevaim, and Ketuvim. You'll all have to learn the Hebrew. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, as we go along. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide. I'm going to spend a little time talking about uh, from uh, uh, how the Old Testament came down to us. You know... I think most people just assume that when Moses wrote the law, the first five books of Moses, that he had enough photocopies of it made that he could hand it out, and you know they kept the original, and that's what you know what is now available somewhere in Jerusalem. Um, it's a lot more complicated than that, and uh, and to some people, a little frustrating because. Most, um, many of the original documents, well, all of the original documents are gone. We have no original documents of even the New Testament, which, which was, you know, half as long ago as the oldest of the Old Testament. The Old Testament was written, the original Hebrew documents of the Old Testament were written between about 1400 and 400 B.C. So that's between 3400 and 2400 years ago. It's almost certain that the oldest books of the Old Testament are Genesis and Job. Job is considered probably even older than Genesis, but those are the oldest. Um, and then it came down from there. So those original documents, most of them were written on papyrus. Have you all ever seen papyrus? Papyrus is an Egyptian invention because in Egypt there is this reed that grows, the papyrus reed. And if you take it and you flatten it out, <coughs> It's kind of sticky, but if you flatten it out, you can make it pretty flat, and if you lay a bunch of them sideways, you know, like vertical, and then you lay a bunch on top of it horizontal, it sticks to itself, and it forms what looks like a piece of paper. And in fact, it was kind of cool because the horizontal pieces of, re of papyrus reed that they put on there actually sort of creates lines that you can write on, you know, to keep things orderly. It's like having lined notebook paper. Papyrus became the most common um, writing medium from uh, like ancient Egypt, I mean thousands of years ago, like 4000 BC. Prior to that, everything had to be either chiseled on stone, which is not very portable, not very easy to do, or for a long time they had cuneiform where they would use clay tablets. They would take a, you know, a, a piece of stone or something and put clay on it, it was malleable, it was soft. And then they had these special stylus that was in the shape of a wedge, and they created alphabets, cuneiform it's called, that the letters of the alphabet were made with different wedge-shaped letters. But there were real limitations with that, okay? You couldn't, how many of those things could you have laid around, all right? Um, the, so papyrus became the dominant form from about 4000 BC to write anything on. And they would use ink that was made from, from charcoal, that sort of thing. The problem is that papyrus is really um, not very long-lasting. I mean, it, it uh, goes away, especially if it gets moist or anything like that. It, it, it decays. Uh, so because most of the original stuff was written on papyrus, this paper-like material made from reeds, most of that was destroyed. And so there, there was a whole industry down through history, in fact. You, you read about the scribes in, in the Bible. Every culture that had ever existed up until the printing press had scribes. A scribe was a person whose job, whose profession it was, to copy things and to write stuff down. And so scribes existed in order to make copies of these, of these parchment, or, or, of these uh, papyrus scrolls. As they started getting worn or old or got damp, they would copy them over and they'd have a new one. Uh, around 300 AD, they started making, well, earlier than that, about 300 BC, they started also using uh, what's called parchment or vellum. Vellum, uh, parchment is animal skin. 
They would take a goat skin or a calf skin. Actually, vellum is just a better quality of parchment. Vellum literally means calf. Um, they would take a skin and they wouldn't tan it. They would just scrape it. If you've ever been in a, in a museum or whatever and you see this sort of white, crinkly kind of uh, old ancient documents, that's parchment, which means an animal skin that was scraped and used to write on. Well, for a long time, just like they had uh, the, the papyrus, they would write on it and then they would attach pieces of it together to make a scroll. All right, and they would, you'd have two rolls of scroll and you roll up one side as you roll open the other and so you just roll right along, so to speak. Um, that wasn't very efficient because it's sort of like a Kindle. You'd say, okay, turn to page 47. How do you do that on a scroll? Okay, you can't. So about 300 AD, about you know 1800 years ago, somebody came up with the idea of instead of with with uh, parchment somewhat, but more so, well, with, I'm sorry, with uh, papyrus somewhat, but especially with parchment, instead of attaching them together and putting them on a roll, somebody came up with the idea: why don't we just lay them on top of each other and then stitch them together, or maybe put a piece of wood or something on the outside to hold them all in place, and that way you can. You can go to the middle of it without having to unroll the whole thing. Those were called codexes. A codex is the ancient form of a book. So if you ever read the word codex, it's an ancient book. Right. They still today. What's that? C O D E X. Sometimes you'll get somebody who's who, uh, an author who's kind of snooty, and he'll say, "Oh yes, my latest codex is you know," um, because codex means means book. But it was the early form of a book. So, the point in all of that is because of how fragile the materials were that they were written on, we have, uh, and other reasons too, we don't have any of the original written manuscripts of the Old Testament. What, what ancient manuscripts would have existed in the first century, right after the time of Jesus, were destroyed when the Romans burned Jerusalem. In AD 70, that is about 40 years or so after Jesus, the Romans got tired of the Jewish people being so uppity and always trying to revolt, and they finally decided to put an end to it, and they destroyed the city of Jerusalem. They burned the temple. That's why if you go there today, if you've been to Jerusalem, there's only one wall, which is called the Wailing Wall, the western wall of the ancient temple, is all that exists. The rest of it was leveled, and they burned it all, and so most of whatever ancient documents would have existed were destroyed at that time. Okay? What year was that? That was in 70 A.D., again, about 45 years or so after Jesus, okay? So those are some of the reasons why we don't have any of the original documents. But because of scribes and committed people of faith down through the centuries, they had continued to copy those over. Now, um, I'll talk in a few minutes about the, some of the... The, the minor differences, but let me reassure you up front. The, some of the ancient sources, and I want to look at some of the sources, like Septuagint Masoretic text. The, ancient, the most ancient sources we do have, the oldest documents that we do have, they do vary some from one to the other. Uh, but the variances between the most ancient documents we have are, mi are minor. It's like there might be a letter added here or a slight variation in a word. No scholar that's not trying to prove a point, a liberal point, no scholars would say that there is any significant difference between our most ancient documents of Old or New Testament. The differences that occur, while there may be some minor differences, have no theological importance. Anything that would make a difference in terms of our understanding of what God wanted us to hear is solid. All of the sources agree on it. Now, there are a few weird things. In a minute, I'm going to talk about the, um, the Samaritan... Pentateuch. You know about the Samaritans, the story of the Good Samaritan and all that? When the two kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah, the northern kingdom was destroyed by Assyria. The Assyrians were a tough lot. When they conquered a people, they carried them off into slavery. They brought other slaves in from other countries they conquered. They forced them to intermarry. And so the Samaritans became half-breeds, for one thing. They weren't pure Jewish anymore, the people who still lived in the northern area of Samaria. And not only that, but they're, because they didn't have access to the temple, they couldn't go to Jerusalem anymore because that wasn't their country, they changed the way they did worship. And one of the things they did, for instance, is we have some ancient documents, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the law, the, the Samaritans, and there are about a thousand Samaritans still alive today. That's all. Okay, and they claim that lineage. The Samaritans have 
um, 11 commandments instead of 10. Because they added to the Ten Commandments in Exodus an Eleventh Commandment that said God told us to build a place to worship on Mount Gezarim in order to legitimize that as being another place that's okay to worship and not just go to Jerusalem to worship. So there are a few weirdnesses like that that are obvious, okay, and, there's, and we understand why. But in terms of anything else, uh, again, any scholar that's not trying to just prove a liberal point, no scholars really believe there's any significant theological differences between any of the ancient writings we have available to us. None of them are the originals. They've all been copies. But the differences are minor, you know, of a letter or a word that's been changed slightly. For instance, the Masoretic text I'm going to talk about right now in a second. Um, it, because it was written by Jews after the time of Jesus, and they were trying to, they were trying to argue against Christianity, they use a different word in the, in the prophet. When the prophets talk about um, a virgin will, um, will give birth, you know, talking about the Virgin Mary, the prophecy, they changed the word for virgin to a word that means young woman. It's a different word. And it's not the same word that's found in the other uh, ancient texts. But we know why they did it, because they were, they were specifically trying to fight against the growth of Christianity. And so they didn't want it to sound like that. They were saying, okay, these Christians are claiming this verse in the Old Testament justifies their belief in this Jesus who was born of a woman they said was a virgin. Let's fight that by changing the word, not have it say virgin anymore. So these were Jewish scribes that did this? And we'll, and we'll get to that, yes. Uh, Bob, uh, right now. Yes. Not the Dead Sea Scrolls. We're going to come to the Dead Sea Scrolls, the most ancient documents that we have of the Old Testament. Okay, let's talk about several things. You might be surprised for me to say that prior to the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were discovered in 1948, the most ancient writing of the Old Testament we had was not in Hebrew, it was in Greek. What happened was, in, uh, when Alexander the Great, in the 4th century BC, conquered the whole known world. And when he conquered the world, he did two things. One, he named almost every city after himself. Okay, there are over 20 Alexandrias in the world because of that. Uh, he went all the way to India. Okay, and he wanted to go all the way to the Pacific Ocean, and his army finally said, okay, that's enough, let's go home. Okay, and he, they turned around and came back, and he died on the way home. But, um, when he conquered all of the known world, all the way down into Egypt, all of Asia Minor, all of the Middle East, all of, you know, Afghanistan, all the way to India, he led uh, to the, really, imposition at first, although then people decided they liked it, of Greek culture, because he was a Macedonian from, from what we know as Greece, the Greek culture and the Greek language, so everybody started speaking Greek. As a result of that, within a hundred years or so, Jews around the eastern Mediterranean especially, who lived in those <coughs> cities, they, after a couple generations, they forgot how to speak Hebrew. Everybody was speaking Greek. Nobody, even young Jews, didn't know how to speak Hebrew anymore, which meant they couldn't read their own Bible. They could not read the Tanakh. They could not read, it wasn't called the Tanakh then. They could not read the Hebrew Bible, though. Um, and so, in uh, the third century B.C., a bunch of scholars, Jewish scholars, the, the the legend is there were 70 or 72, depending on which version you look at. Jewish scholars came from Jerusalem down to Alexandria, Alexandria in Egypt, you know, which was one of the major cities. It was the, the second largest city in the civilized world at that point. They came to Alexandria and they were commissioned to do a translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek. Now this is 300 years before Jesus. Okay, This is 3rd century BC. <coughs> They, they accessed all of the ancient writings that were available to them. And remember that this was the days when there was still the famous library of Alexandria. Okay, it hadn't been destroyed yet. And so they had documents there that were existing probably nowhere else in the world. And then during Cleopatra's time, the Library of Alexandria, the greatest repository of knowledge ever known in history, was burned down. Uh, but they had access to all these ancient documents. So they translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek. That is called the Septuagint, for the Greek word for 70. Septua? 70? So the Septuagint is a 3rd century B.C. Uh, translation of the Hebrew Bible. The reason why it's important is because the people, even though they translated it into Greek, we now have that Greek which is based upon the most ancient Hebrew documents which no longer exist with the exception of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which we didn't find until 50, 60 years ago, 60 years ago, okay. Now, 
So the Septuagint became a major source for understanding what the original Hebrew would have said because it is the most ancient documents we had, even though they were translated into Greek for us. Okay, you understand that? Mm -hmm. That's why you will hear the Septuagint referred to. And by the way, if you ever see in your readings, if you see LXX, that's the Septuagint. That's the shorthand symbol for the Septuagint. LXX is what? Uh, it's the Roman numeral for 70. So LXX is the symbol, shorthand symbol for the Septuagint. You've probably seen that before in reading and didn't know what it was. You'll see that maybe even in footnotes in your Bible. They'll say, well, variant reading in the LXX is. That's the Septuagint, which is one of the most ancient sources we have. Okay. The second thing I want to mention is the Masoretic text. Now, the Masoretic text is, um, comes quite a bit later. A group of scholars who were working in Jerusalem and in Tiberias in Israel, some of them were working in, in Babylon, which is modern-day uh, Iraq, between the 7th and the 11th century A.D. Okay, so this is 650 years after Jesus, at the earliest. 7th to 11th century A.D., as I mentioned earlier, they were frustrated because the Christians, Christianity by that time, had become the dominant religion. By the 7th century A.D., it was the religion of the Roman Empire, thanks to First Constantine and then Theodosius. Okay. If you all want to learn more about that, then I'm going to be speaking on a cruise in October next year, and I'm going to be talking about all that kind of stuff. Okay. We're going to talk about the Byzantine Empire and all that. The, the, but Theodosius is the one that made Christianity the legal religion of the empire, and that was before the 7th century. So the Jews looked around and they said, these Christians, darn them, they are using the Septuagint, the Greek translation of our Hebrew Bible, as their Old Testament document, and we don't like that. We need to do something to get people focused back on the Hebrew again. So they went in and created the Masoretic text, which became the authoritative, or the, the most um, commonly appealed to, Hebrew text of the Old Testament. Septuagint was in Greek. The Masoretes created the Masoretic text in the 7th to 11th century, which is the Hebrew translation of the Old Testament. Yes? So they translated it back from the Greek to Hebrew. Much of what they did was translate the Greek back to Hebrew, but apparently in the 7th to 11th century, they also had some very old Hebrew documents, which we don't know about. Now, the main reason why this became the authoritative text is because they not only translated the Hebrew or the Greek to Hebrew, and, and, and gave us a, the Old Testament in Hebrew again, so to speak. But they also, um, they added to it. Uh, let me explain this. Hebrew, like most ancient languages, does not have any vowels. Okay? Did you know that? Ancient vowels, A-E-I-O-U, are breathing sounds that help you pronounce things. If you're writing it down, you don't need vowels. All you need are the consonants. Hebrew, written Hebrew, only used consonants. Well, the problem was that they, they, they had to teach people how to pronounce it. Okay? Um, and so they created, the Masoretes created what was called vowel points and cantillation marks. Would you go to the next slide, please? This is Hebrew. These dots, which are in red so that you can see them, the red dots and lines are vowel points. They were added because by the 7th through the 11th century, people had forgotten how to pronounce some of the Old Testament words. They're still Hebrew words we don't know how to pronounce. Huh. When Israel was formed as a nation, Hebrew was a dead language. Pronunciation was something they had to decide. In many cases, they didn't know how to pronounce it. Well, the Masoretes come along in the Masoretic text between the 7th and 11th century, and they look at all the documents, not only the, the Septuagint and the Hebrew documents they had, but the Talmud, which I'm going to describe in a minute, and other documents, and they say, this is how to pronounce this, these words. So, and you know, Hebrew reads from right to left, okay? So it starts here, it goes that way. They added the vowel points, the vowel markings, and they also added, these blue marks are cantillation marks. You know what a cantor is? The song singer. Uh, it's somebody who sings the words like to scripture. If you go to a high Anglican church, they will sing the words to the readings for the day, kind of thing, okay? Well, that's the way the Jews, don't forgive that example, okay? <laughs> I probably should have actually brought something I could do a cantor with, but I just made that up. Uh, the cantillation, because the Hebrew scripture was meant to be read out loud, 
it, they, they didn't just read it the way I'm speaking now, but they would read it like a cantor would, would do it. And so they need emphasis marks. In addition to having the vowel points, they needed marks to tell them well, where do you go up and where do you come down? What's the, because there was, a, there was a right way and a wrong way to do that. So the Masoretes come along and they not only do a Hebrew Bible based upon the, the Septuagint and other documents, but they also put in the vowel points, they put in the cantillation <coughs> marks. And because that was so helpful, this became the authoritative Hebrew version of the Bible. Okay? Between the 7th and the 11th century. Understand? You got that? Okay, let's keep going. A uh, question. Yes. So what we have here then is based on the Masoretic text? What we have here is a combination of Septuagint, some the mo modern versions, they've taken into account some of what we've learned from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, they've taken into account some of what the Masoretic text, basically good scholarship today looks at all this stuff and says, okay, if we've got five versions and this particular word is the same in four of them and not in the fifth one, then it's probably the one that's in the four. In cases where they have older documents versus newer documents, they'll look at the older ones. The good translations that exist today, they look at all these sources. To, to draw from, okay? So you have Septuagint, the Masoretic text, then there are other sources. I mentioned the ancient Samaritan Pentateuch, which is ancient. We don't even know exactly how old it is. Most of it completely agrees with the translations in the Septuagint or with the Dead Sea Scrolls, with some variations. There are a few weirdnesses, like the fact they added the 11th commandment, <laughs> but, and a few other things. But it is. But there are other sources like that that are valuable in learning what the original text said. Then we have the Talmud. You've probably heard of Talmud or Talmud, Talmudic literature or Talmudic arguments. Between 200 and 500 AD, we need to remember that originally uh, Hebrew teaching, Jewish teaching, was oral. You know, for a long, long time it was oral. Now things were written, but it was mostly oral, and so a lot of the oral teaching and things were memorized and carried on down, and then eventually. In the early part of the, of the uh, Anno Domini, of the modern age, 200 to 500, they started writing this stuff down. So the Talmud is a written compendium of the Jewish oral law, much of it being an explanation of what's in the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, or the Torah especially. And then it's, it's got two parts, the Mishnah and the Gemara. Sometimes you'll hear Gemara as being a synonym for Talmud. There, it's it's a, the Jewish law and commentary on the Bible. In many Jewish circles, the Talmud has become just almost as authoritative as the, as the Tanakh itself. Because it's the wisdom of the ages kind of thing for the Jewish people. Okay? Let's keep going. You then have, in the 4th century AD, St. Jerome was commissioned to take all these bits and pieces of Greek and stuff. Because, you know, by the 4th century AD, Latin had become the dominant language, not Greek anymore. Scholars still spoke Greek, Latin was still considered kind of plebeian, kind of common, but still there were people who spoke Latin. And so Jerome was commissioned to create a Latin version of the Bible. So he creates the Latin Vulgate, which um, his Old Testament, he relied on the Septuagint. Again, some documents by the 4th century AD, there was, there was stuff that was available that we no longer have. Some stuff has been lost. You wonder who is responsible to keep track of this stuff. But they lost stuff. So he translated, and especially his Old Testament stuff is considered very valuable. The Latin Vulgate, for a long time, several hundred years, nobody liked it. The Catholic Church wouldn't accept it because it wasn't entirely based upon the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, and the Septuagint was considered divinely inspired almost, that God had acted divinely in that. Much later, at the Council of Trent, after the Reformation, thank you Martin Luther and others, the, after the Reformation, the Catholic Church got together to launch the Counter-Reformation, to fight against the Protestant movement. And it was launched at the Council of Trent, which is when the Catholics got together and made all their arguments for why the Protestants were wrong and what they were going to do about it. At the Council of Trent, they reaffirmed the fact that the Latin Vulgate, which was the Bible that the Catholics were generally using then, was absolutely convincingly the authoritative word of God, and, you know, and it should be in Latin and not something else. Remember back then, you didn't get common language uh, scripture or common language services. It was all in Latin. So that's the Latin Vulgate. And some of it is valuable because, again, Jerome used very ancient documents. This is still 4th century AD. The Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, in 1948, a shepherd 
in sort of the southern area near the Negev Desert in um, an area called Umran in Israel, uh, was chasing a goat, apparently. And there are, there are hillsides down there that have got caves everywhere. Well, he was chasing this goat, and he sees this cave, and he goes in, and he finds these big ceramic jars that have been in this cave. It is very dry in this part of the world. See, one of the reasons that parchment didn't last, or I'm sorry, that uh, papyrus didn't last very long is because in any moisture at all, it just rots. It's a plant, after all, and it does what, what organic things do in moist climate, and it, it rots. Well, it was completely dry in the Negev Desert as it is in parts of Egypt, where some, some ancient documents have, have survived. Well, he finds these jars, and in it, he finds what we have come to know as the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls are um, 600, I'm sorry, 960, well, let me get 72. this right, 72. 72. Oh, what do you do that? 972 texts, mostly of the Hebrew Bible. We have, for instance, all of the book of Isaiah portions of other Old Testament writings that go back as far as four, the 4th century B.C., the most recent of the documents there is the 3rd century A.D. 4th century B.C. makes some of these the oldest extant Hebrew documents that we have. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls, extant means still surviving. Uh, if I use words like that, you don't know what they mean, you stop me, okay? Um, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls were really significant because for the first time, we were able to take this more, these more ancient documents and say, how does that compare to what we have today? You know, the Septuagint, which came a little later than some of the, that oldest part, but it was in Greek, and so we had to retranslate it back into Hebrew, and some of the, and the Masoretes and whatnot. For the most part, the Dead Sea Scrolls have proven that modern scholarship, the modern versions that we have, are completely accurate. In fact, the Dead Sea Scrolls are so consistent as ancient documents in support of more modern documents that liberal scholars had to sort of eat, eat crow. Because liberal scholars had said for so long, oh, well, you know, that's been changed so many times. But everybody who copied it added what they thought, and they didn't like this, and they said, ah, yeah, but pastrami's horrible for lunch, gives me gas, and they put that in scripture. And whatever it was, they said, you can't trust it anymore. We get the Dead Sea Scrolls, some of which are from 400 BC, and they're almost exactly what we have today, with very minor changes, none of which are theologically significant. The liberal scholars no longer had the argument that, oh, well, if we just had older documents, then we'd know that this is not accurate. So the Dead Sea Scrolls are really significant in that regard. In addition to being parts of the Hebrew Bible, we also have some other writings that are apocrypha or pseudepigraphal books. I'll tell you about those. And then some that are just sort of common day-to-day -day life you know, documents uh, that are written. And again, no, there, no, there is not absolute agreement in these ancient and authoritative Old Testament documents, but the differences are almost all very minor, do not, con or not considered theologically significant. When I say almost all very minor, the ones that aren't minor are obvious, like the Samaritans adding a commandment that says God wanted them to build a place to worship on Mount Gezogin, which was right outside Samaria. Okay. Um, other than that, the... Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls has verified the, the accuracy which with, with which the scriptures have been carried down to us from the original days. Now, they're written not only in Hebrew, but some in Greek, some in Aramaic, some in Nabataean, which is a version of Aramaic that was common in the West in that time. Um, let me take just a second, and then I want to do a last, a last, uh, the last thing I'm going to deal with today is higher criticism and documentary hypothesis. But I want to mention to you, uh, about Apocrypha and Pseudepigraphal books, because I mentioned the Council of Trent. When Jerome was doing the, um, the, what's that? Vulgate. Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate. Uh, actually, let me back up to that, I'll give you a better explanation. When the Jewish scholars were writing the Septuagint, they decided that um, not because it was canon, meaning authoritative word of God, but because it was useful they would include some more recent writings that had been done that happened during the intertestamental period, the Hasmonean period when the Maccabees saved Judaism. And so they included some writings in the Septuagint, which were not considered equal to the writings that God gave, the, the canon. They were called deuterocanonical, or second level, meaning, yeah, there's some valuable history and stuff in here, but don't count this as God's word. When Jerome came along, Jerome translated that stuff, same stuff, into um, Latin. 
So it became part of the Catholic Bible. Okay? But it was still, Jerome still insisted, this is not the same as the rest of the Word of God. These other books, there are seven books in the Apocrypha, are deuterocanonical. They're second level. They're not equal to the canon of God. What happened was, the Protestants come along, and in these other books, there are 46 books in the Old Testament of the Catholic Bible, the Protestants say, okay, the, the Jews have rejected these, because after, after the Septuagint, the, the Jews came along, and when they created the Tanakh and decided what is the firm Hebrew Bible, they said, these books shouldn't be in the Bible. They're interesting, and you know they're fun reading, but they're not the Word of God. The Jews had rejected the apocryphal books, Tobit, Maccabees, etc., from the Bible. The Protestants come along and say, well, the Jews don't think they're part of their Bible. Nowhere are they quoted by Jesus or the writers of the New Testament. We don't think they ought to be in the Bible either. So the Protestants took them out. Along comes the Council of Trent, which I mentioned a minute ago, which is where the Catholics got together to officially declare their opposition to the Protestant movement and to fight back the counter-reformation against the Protestants. And almost because, it's, the sense I always get is, I have this picture of being sort of in spite. Well, we'll show you Protestants. You say that the apocryphal books shouldn't be in the Bible. Well, we're no longer going to keep them in as deuterocanonical. We're actually going to make them full canon. <laughs> You Protestants don't like them? Huh, we'll show you. They're going to be part of the official Bible now. So these extra six books, uh, seven books actually, that were the Apocrypha, which you'll find in a Catholic Bible, were made canon, although they're still read sort of separately, even by Catholics, I think, but the, but the Protestants don't include them. Then you have a group of books which are called the pseudepigraphal books. Apocrypha means hidden writing. Pseudepigrapha means false writing. These are things like the Gnostic Gospels you've heard about, the Gospel of Thomas, the, uh, and there, there are a bunch of them, there are a bunch of them. And from the very earliest days, the church called them pseudepigrapha, which means false writing. They're not true. They make stuff up. And nobody has ever considered them to be really part of scripture, but interestingly enough, some of them are in the Dead Sea Scrolls, because they're ancient. And some of them were included in that, but they're not considered authoritative. And if all you have to do is read some of them with half, with, with read them sober, and anybody can tell this is this doesn't ring true. I mean, you're reading along and it seems fine, and then it goes nuts. You know, for instance, Jesus as a child, uh, kids teased him, so he struck him dead. You know that Jesus helped his father Joseph in a carpenter shop, and because Jesus was perfect. Um, he made thrones that were so perfect that kings from all over the earth would come to Joseph's little carpenter shop in Nazareth to get them. And Joseph would screw things up. He made a bed that was too short one time, so Jesus, as a child, just sort of stretched it, made it big enough for the people who wanted it. That kind of stuff that nobody believes is real. Those are the pseudepigraphal books. So you'll hear Apocrypha, which is in the Catholic Bible, pseudepigrapha, which is not in anybody's Bible, but you get some people like Elaine Pagels and others who keep trying to say, oh, well, these should be Bible too. It was only for political reasons that Constantine threw them out. That's what Dan Brown says in the, in, the, in uh, okay. Da Vinci Code. It's bad history, really, really, really bad history. That's not the way it happened. Well, I was going to ask if there's if there's a debate now because they found this in the in the, in the Judean desert, you know, with the Dead Sea Scroll. Is there is there an academic debate between the the validity of these things today, and you just answered. Yeah, not not some of the fringe people. Not are seriously. Trying, yeah. yeah, there are fringe people who basically that's how they make that's their career. Yeah, you know, they, they can yeah. to do books and talks about that. Yeah. Uh, other than that, there's no serious scholars I'm aware of who, who hold of that. Yeah. And the Jesus seminars. Well, Jesus seminar, they're, they're just. Yeah, they, they don't even, they don't look to the the superficial books or anything. That's just a bunch of uh, liberals who want to say they don't believe anything Jesus said was real. Uh, I got one other thing I want to mention to you, and then we'll stop. I'm a couple minutes over. Uh, next, next uh, slide. By next week, I'll have this worked out, so you don't have to do this. I'm only going to mention this not because I think it's valid, but because you're going to bump into it as you go along. The documentary hypothesis, or and, and it's a form of higher criticism. You've heard about higher criticism as applied to the Bible. Back in the 18th and 19th centuries, scholars, most of them German. Um, the Germans have given us a lot of really wonderful things, music and art and things like that, but they've given us the worst theologians ever. I mean, they've given us great theologians, but they've given us theologians that have really messed us up. Well, a number of those theologians, most particularly uh, Julius Wellhausen, in 1899, he, he 
he published, that's when he published his most dominant uh, theory. He didn't invent this, but he perfected it. This idea called documentary hypothesis, they started with three assumptions. First, they assumed that Moses couldn't write, and therefore he could not have written the Torah, because they believed back then that writing did not come along to the Semitic people until much later. That has been disproven many times over in the 20th century. They have found documents much older than Moses, where they wrote perfectly well, thank you very much. Uh, and if we believe that Moses was raised in the court of the, of the Pharaoh, being the, the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter, then he would have given, been given the best education possible. If anybody could write in those days, he would have been able to. So that first assumption they made no longer holds water. Second, they assumed that the, because the Torah has a lot to do with divine stuff, you know, that, that there's miracles happening and all kinds of stuff, they assume miracles aren't possible. Supernatural doesn't exist, and so therefore this can't be what it professes to be because it's got miraculous stuff in it. So their assumption that everything had to be explainable by natural law caused them to believe there was something wrong, especially with the Pentateuch, the Torah, the first five books. And thirdly, they would read, they, Wellhausen and others, read the, um, the Torah, especially Genesis, and he noticed that some places they refer to God by the name Yahweh. In other places, they refer to God as Elohim, which is the generic word for God or Lord. Other places, there are, you know, the, the different influences. They ended up saying, Wellhausen and others, they came up with a documentary hypothesis that said, Moses could not have and did not write the Torah, the five books of Moses. And in fact, they identified multiple sources, multiple writers, and they identified four of them. And I put this up here because as you read along and study, you'll come across J-E-D-P. Those are the letters that are used to represent what the, the documentary hypothesis guys believe were the four major sources for the, the four major writing sources for the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. The first one is J, which is Yahwist. The reason is because, remember, these are German, and J is the letter that sounds Yah. Okay, in German. So, J, they believe, was the Yahwist source or writer, and they believe that didn't happen until about 950 BC, which is a 450 years after Moses. Quite a long time. The second source they believe is the Elohist source. They don't know who it was, but because that source uses the word Elohim, Lord, generic God. And they believe that probably was 850 BC. The Yahwist was believed to be in the southern kingdom of Judah. The Elohist from the northern kingdom of Israel, they don't really have any documentation for this. Okay, there's really Convenient. no support for this. Convenient. The third, they believe to be the Deuteronomist, which is the whole book of Deuteronomy and other places which deals with the law. They believe that it was about 600 BC in Jerusalem. And finally, the priestly source, the part of the Pentateuch that deals with priestly order and, and ritual and law and stuff, to be about 500 BC, and there was Jewish priests, uh, priests who were exiled in Babylon. The documentary hypothesis, or JEDP, has been resoundingly rejected by recent discoveries, by recent scholarship. Everybody worth their salt now recognizes that it entirely was based upon a, an assumption of prejudice against Moses, against the divine authorship of Scripture, against the miraculous nature of the Word of God. And so, and, and plus now, scholars who have studied form criticism, that is, form criticism being the forms that things are written in and what they mean. The guys who do documentary hypothesis, Wellhausen and others, they claimed, well, you've got two, two creation stories. There's one creation story in Genesis 1, there's another creation story in Genesis 2. Must be two different writers. Hmm. There are places where, for instance, you have um, Abraham telling the Pharaoh that Sarah was his sister, not his wife, and then you have Isaac doing the same thing with his wife. Hmm. Well, somebody copied that. It's not the same writer. Recent form, uh, form critics have looked at this and said that sort of thing happens all the time. Happened all the time in Jewish writing. I mean, Genesis one is the broad stroke creation story. Genesis two focuses on the people part of it, and that sort of thing was common. The idea of having parallelism and telling stories, and somebody's even observed, well, if Isaiah's father Abraham acted like that, it's not unbelievable that maybe he thought that was okay to do. Okay. A lot of other people have come along since, and they have, they have destroyed any, any arguments that have been in favor of the documentary hypothesis, 
and they have presented other arguments, scholarly arguments for other explanations for some of those things, like repetitions and things of that sort, <coughs> based upon more modern understanding of form criticism, documentary analysis. So, I only give you this because when you talk about the Torah, this is applied specifically to the Torah, the first five books, the Pentateuch. Um, you're going to run into this. If you read anything at all about this, somebody's going to mention it at some time or another. You need to know that it has been almost completely discounted by any scholars worth their salt. The only holdouts are those people who have a presumption that they don't believe in anything miraculous or, or that they don't believe this is the Word of God. It's just something a bunch of people made up a long time ago. Okay? Questions or comments about any of this? That first one of J, that is what? what? It's Yahwist. Or if, if you were speaking German, it would be Jawist. Yeah. Well, all of this is German. Yahwist is from the, the Hebrew name, the proper name for God in the Old Testament is Yahweh. <coughs> and so whenever the name Yahweh is used, they call that the Yahwist source. And, and here's an interesting one. Remember earlier I showed you the vowel points, the, the Masoretic text, that, that Hebrew is written only with consonants. And then we added, yeah, go back to it. And then they added the vowel points later. Oops. That's alright. Um, the word Jehovah, you all know Jehovah, right? Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah's Witnesses, Jehovah. There's no such word as Jehovah. In the Old Testament, the proper name for God is given as Yahweh. In, in English transliteration, it's Y-H-W-H. -H. Well, in the Old Testament, Jews were not allowed to say the name of God. Because the idea of do not take my name in vain, you know, one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not take the, Lord thy, the name of the Lord thy God in vain. The Jews, in order to make sure they never made the mistake of taking God's name in vain, they would not say it. They would not pronounce it. So here, when they got to the word Yahweh, they would use this to teach young boys, especially, how to read Scripture out loud. You remember a, a um, bar mitzvah? is when a boy becomes a man, and one of the things is he has to stand up in front of the congregation, he has to read from the Torah, okay? Well, when they were teaching young boys how to read the name of God, they were allowed to say the name of God. Whenever they got to that word, Yahweh, that's not this word, by the way. That's different, those are different letters, I'm just pointing. Um, when they got to Yahweh, they were supposed to say Adonai, which is, again, a generic word for Lord. Okay. So they would come to the word Adonai, and come to the word Yahweh, but they were supposed to say Adonai because you weren't allowed to say the name of God, Yahweh. What happened was, later on, somebody took the consonants for Yahweh and the vowels for Adonai, which they had written in so that these boys would remember that. Yet the Jehovah is the consonants from Yahweh and the vowels from Adonai. Put them together and you get Jehovah. There's not really any such word. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with it. We don't even know for sure what the vowels would have been in Yahweh. We assume it, it's it's proper in English transliteration would be Y A H W E H, but we don't know. Okay. Are the dots above where they went up and down? You said. Well, the blue, the blue are the cantillation. What's up above? Then? Well, the, some of the vowel points go up above. You know, the red dots are vowel and lines are, are vowel indications. They're called vowel points. And then the blue are the cantillations to tell them what accent to use. Any other questions or comments? I hope this is interesting to you guys. I love this stuff. Next week we are going to start with yeah, that's fine. Next week we.